most of us, I think, are aware of the necessary tension between culture, the government, and the church. It's nothing new. As we heard in our first lesson today, God sent Amos, who was not a professional prophet, but a working man, to pronounce doom upon the leaders of the national religious establishment, as well as on the king and the government. Amos may not have been a professional, but he was a prophet, a prophet who had learned how to get under the skin of self-absorbed leaders. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, complains to King Jeroboam, uh, to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, the land is not able to bear all of his words. Then Amaziah begs Amos, O seer, flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, why don't you? Leave us alone. Some of us recognize the situation put forth in the lesson from Amos as something we may have seen the likes of, seen it in the past, and we're currently witnessing some of it today. But in our experience, it appears that the supposed prophets really are no prophets. We might remember the parade of preachers to the White House during the 60s, whose message was merely an echo of national interest, sort of a nationalism with a halo. It was a phenomenon that is still popular with some TV evangelists as witnessed in the 2016 election cycle. We get fed a stew of civic religion with a bit of gospel garnish on the side. Every election year, there is a resurrection of the concept of America's favored place in God's purposes. There always has been and always will be a question about the relation of religion to the state and culture. Hindsight has offered the insight that consistent agreement and peace between the church and government is almost always suspect. We hear politicians twist the life out of the word of the gospel, and we watch our leaders, the leaders of our government, attempt to justify their actions of taking children away from their parents to deter legal immigration. In both the first lesson and the gospel, there is an assumption that God's word, clearly spoken, stands over and against the human scene, and that that word will be at times rejected. Yes, we too must stand up to protest what is wrong in our society and in our government. That is part of what we are called to do. And it is dangerous. And it is difficult to do well. Look at the sad dynamics of the gospel account of Herod, Herodias, and John the Baptist. The whole thing is sorted Shabby, shameful. It's the kind of news that everyone wants to hear, however much they pretend otherwise. The scandalous things going on at Herod's big birthday party with his stepdaughter's exotic dancing, his own rash and no doubt drunken promise, and his commitment to execute the prophet to whom all Galilee and Judea had gone to for baptism. 
It probably makes everyone in Palestine reasonably certain that no good is going to come from this. Tragically, we can clearly discern that Herod did not want John the Baptist beheaded. Herod had no desire for the prophet's severed head to be served on a platter and given to his daughter Herodias. Herod did not want or plan for his party banquet to end in ruthlessness and bloodshed, but he had given his word. Herod ordered the death of a man whom he knew to be holy and just. Quoting a recent commentary in a church periodical, an obsession with power, prestige, and reputation provide motive again and again for evils that would not otherwise or that otherwise would not would not be committed. Those things, obsession of power, prestige, and reputation, make the opportunity for evils to be committed. This is the way it has been from the beginning. It is the way it will always be until all powers are subject to Christ the King. Improper motive is also an ever-present enemy of followers of Christ. It's the enemy of our ministries. Interest in power, prestige, and reputation have ruined many a priest, many a vestry member, and soup kitchen worker. We're better to recall John the Baptist's own words about the Christ to come. John said, speaking of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. Sadly, our perceived notion of improper motivation in some evangelists, some, has soured any thought of ours to doing the work of evangelists, even though the Book of Common Prayer clearly states that the ministry of lay persons is to represent Christ and his church, to bear witness to him, and to carry on Christ's work of reconciliation in the world. Representing and bearing witness to Christ is not on some list of possible choices. Rather, it is a calling, it is the calling, it is the duty of every follower of Christ. In these readings from Amos and Mark, we hear about some of God's people striving to live out God's mission in the world. And so we are presented with four basic points. The first is authority. In Amos, God the Father In Mark, Jesus the Christ, that was the authority of their work. John the Baptist was sort of in between, sent by the Father to prepare the way for Jesus. The prophet and the twelve, and John the Baptist for that matter, are quite ordinary people, but they're given an extraordinary responsibility Their power, you see, comes not from their status of life, but from the one who sends them. Secondly, there is the message. What matters supremely more than apparent success or failure is our fidelity to God's message. Amos failed at Bethel. And the twelve were warned that people might refuse to hear them, and they did. But they were true. They were true to the demands of the gospel. And then third, there is the opposition, rejection, 
is always expected. The word of God must be delivered in the face of opposition from the advocates of civil religion and from the opposition of those obsessed with power, prestige, and reputation. Fourth, there is the sense of urgency. We actually are not offered unlimited time to ponder about the message, but we're called to deliver it now. Only our faith can provide us with what we desperately need to do this work. Our faith gives us the assurance and the awareness of the presence of God in the world. That's how we can do these things. As we draw closer to God through prayer, worship, and study, we can see his hand at work transforming others and transforming us, enabling us to act in love and unity. Our faith, you see, gives us perspective, delivering us from a material view of the world and from our own human existence. Our faith allows us to understand ourselves as an important part of God's work in his creation. Gradually, ever so gradually, we begin to see beyond our dull self-centeredness beyond our selfish, superficial concerns, beginning to realize that God, God is the one who chooses, commissions, and sends. It is his message, his authority, his power that bears fruit. Though God's presence with a proper, through God's presence with a proper perspective, Life is now seen to have a point, a purpose, a value. Above all, it is in this perspective and presence, God's perspective, his presence, that we find the power of God's redeeming love, that we can take his redeeming power into the world. It's that perspective and his presence. God's children have always doubted their ability to do his work, always. But the faithful throughout the ages have relied upon him and have walked in faith so that what they may work at what they are called to do. The church can only, and I do mean only, become alive and move on in history by focusing its life on God's loving care in Christ, in Christ and in his teaching. To quote former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, he said, it is not the church of God that has a mission. It is the God of mission that has a church. Williams is saying God is at work in the world to redeem creation, and God invites us to participate in this mission. God is not interested in getting more and more people into the institutional church. Instead, the church is to be God's hands and feet in accomplishing God's mission. That's Williams. This is me. Again, me again. Our work in God's church is always about our dependence upon God, always about our obedience to God, and always about his way, his message. I would like to close with the following prayer that a dear friend of mine shared with me this week. Please remain seated and we'll bow our heads. Let us pray. Lord, anoint us with fire so that your word burns in our hearts 
and shines brightly outward. Erase divisions among us. Goad us into the daredevil leap, into the bottomless abyss of your love. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.